All right, I think pleasure and honor of uh, introducing our closer uh, for the plenaries. And um, I've been uh, anticipating uh, this particular talk for quite some time. I'm not trying to put a lot of pressure on uh, Dr. Martin Paulus. Uh, I know that he is uh, quite capable of, of delighting us and, and inspiring us today. So uh, I'm going to do a short introduction and give him his time. He is the scientific director and president of the Laurie Institute for Brain Research in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, he joined this uh, institution in 2014. Uh, prior to that, he was at uh, UCSD in the Department of Psychiatry and also in the VA uh, in the San Diego uh, healthcare system. Uh, he's really received a number of awards and he serves on many editorial boards, including Biological Psychiatry uh, and JAMA Psychiatry. And plus, he has numerous grants from NIMH and NIDA. His research focuses on how to use neuroscience-based measurements to generate individual level predictions that can be useful to clinicians. Moreover, uh, he's interested in whether computational approaches can be useful to better develop explanatory basis for psychiatric disorders that can be submitted to rigorous scientific examination. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paulus uh, to the stage. Well, again, uh, I want to thank the uh, the organizers and uh, program committee for um, giving me the slot and giving me the last slot of the uh, plenary. Uh, I'm very honored to be able to speak to you today. Uh, so I, I'll go uh, right into it because I know we're a little um, late in the day for the uh, for this morning session. So these are my disclosures. I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline of what I will be talking about, and what I'm hoping to do is uh, span an arc over work that uh, I've been doing with a number of people, which I will show you at the very end, um, uh, that focuses really on how we begin to parse decision-making as it re uh, relates to problems in psychiatry. Um, so essentially, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the difference between an explanatory and a pragmatic framework is something that I've sort of recently tried to uh, verbalize, and I think it, it can be useful, in particular given some of the questions that, uh, were, uh, that surfaced during the last few talks, I think this will be useful. Uh, I will then talk about uh, decision-making and how we started to look at decision-making in psychiatric disorders, um, and I will uh, begin by uh, highlighting that really, uh, which should be obvious to all of us, that human beings are not computers. Human beings are not strict Bayesian or uh, frequentist uh, decision-makers, and I'll show you what I mean by that um, in, in, in those slides. Um, I will then highlight a particular brain structure that we've worked quite a bit on, which is the insular cortex, um, and I will uh, focus on how, what is the contribution of the insular cortex uh, to decision making, but also then by extension, how might dysfunction in the insula contribute to dysfunction uh, in psychiatric uh, population. And I will focus particularly on two disorder classes, uh, anxiety in the general terms, and then also uh, addiction. Um, and finally, then, I will make the transition to show why we need computational psychiatry um, and what will computational psychiatry add to our understanding and potentially to um, also our predictions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about computational failure modes, which are hypotheses uh, put into a computational framework that should be subjected to testing and, in fact, that we are subject to testing right now. And finally, I will highlight some challenges um, and these challenges are quite profound. You will see, I'll uh, point out some work that has been recently done by very, very uh, 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 amazing groups, um, but that should give us pause in how we think about uh, to measure behavior, uh, to think about diseases, um, and how we uh, need to incorporate that knowledge into, um, into future studies. So let me start out by talking a little bit about um, the explanatory and pragmatic framework. I think it's useful. This is something I've recently uh, uh, written on. Um, it, I was driven primarily by um, how can we solve interesting and important problems that actually have clinical application. That is, in a sense, what drives me. I'm a psychiatrist by training, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm a jack of many trades uh, uh, over the years. Um, but I think what is important as you are starting to uh, assess what kinds of questions you want to address is that we really want to see, you know, what are the questions that are out there. I think this is something that came up in the question session uh, before. Uh, we need to uh, basically pay attention to our stakeholders. Um, and these are not just people in this room. 
Um, but I think that from a, uh, from a, a, a practical perspective, uh, in terms of, unfortunately it doesn't, um, so I'm gonna have to, uh, uh, um, so just to kind of, uh, uh, a little break, unfortunately the, the, uh, I had highlighted certain areas of the slide, which unfortunately does not show up in this, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation. So I'm gonna basically describe to you what I will highlight. Um, so uh, the, the point here is that um, we basically have two primary goals. Yeah, okay, that's actually true, yeah. Um, if, if you think about it, we have uh, one primary goal is to build explanatory disease models. Um, and this gets to uh, essentially uh, trying to discover mechanisms of disease. Um, and that, of course, speaks also to levels of causality. And we have to be very careful that, in fact, many of our human studies um, have very limited uh, levels of causality that we can actually delve into. And um, I think we've heard in some of the talks during the meeting uh, about the importance of animal studies. Um, we also heard this morning about the differences in, uh, uh, in animals. But I think it's important that we need to think one goal for our research is, um, is to understand the, me the mechanics. Um, and in a sense, from a decision perspective, is what are the decision-making dysfunction and how do they come about? And some of the uh, beautiful work that um, uh, Yael has shown uh, gives us tools that potentially can begin to get to this. So how does the uh, then the brain contribute to this and how does the brain compute these dysfunctions? On the other side, um, we have a more pragmatic goal. And the pragmatic goal is, and we talked, uh, and uh, Jane talked about this, um, is to make uh, 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 generating individual level predictions. And we can quibble about the terms, and obviously it's important in some level to know exactly what you, uh, 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 to, uh, know exactly what you're talking about when you talk about prediction. But in any case, we're trying to make individual level predictions that hopefully, eventually, will, have, uh, will help the mental health provider to make better treatment decisions. Um, and so, you know, so we're vacillating between these two goals. And what I'm hoping to, what I'm hoping to, uh, 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 come across in the end is that I think what computational psychiatry will allow you to do, it may allow you to, to bridge those two gaps, this explanatory and the pragmatic goal, and uh, be able to do both um, uh, in, in a similar way. So let me talk a little bit about sort of factors of effect decision makes and how we actually got into this, um, uh, into this field. This was many years ago. So this is something that probably many of you have seen. This is a very famous paper uh, that was written by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky at the end of the 1970s. It led eventually to them uh, winning the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, Amos Tversky uh, died before that. Um, but the, the, the central discovery that both of them uh, made was that, in, that we as human beings um, transform numbers into constructs um, in a nonlinear way. So on the left-hand side, what you see is uh, what's called the value function. And uh, the point that uh, 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 Kahneman and Tversky made is that gains and losses are transferred into values. And these values um, in the gain domain are such that uh, the marginal increase gets smaller and smaller. What that basically means is that if I give you a dollar um, and I give you three dollars, you get uh, a certain excitement. You value that a certain way. But if I give you a hundred dollars and a hundred three dollars, that difference is significantly attenuated. That was one of the uh, nonlinear transformation. But the other important element is, and what they've early recognized, is that in the loss domain, this uh, function is actually quite uh, 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 different and it's much steeper. So that if I take two dollars away from you, that hurts you a lot more than if I give you two dollars. So that was the first uh, um, insight. And it, it gives rise to all kinds of interesting behavior uh, that people display and that gives rise to problems that uh, we see in all kinds of uh, environments. Now the other issue is that they also uh, transformed uh, they also showed that uh, probabilities are transformed in a certain way into decision weights. And it, it, it so happens that what we tend to do, we tend to overweigh uh, small probabilities and underweigh large probabilities. So that um, you can see, and again, unfortunately, it's not very, uh, that basically what they showed is that um, the decision weights are overproportionately larger for small probabilities. Again, this gives rise to all kinds of uh, interesting behavior. So 
what we did is actually we uh, we used a very very uh, uh, similar approach to what uh, Kahneman and Tversky used to inquire what actually happens in the brain of people as they're making these decisions about weights and values. Um, and what I show you here is essentially uh, three main graphs. The upper left graph um, is the uh, decision weight function, and we basically recovered the decision weight function, just like many other groups had done before. Um, and um, and we also recovered the value function, um, uh, so giving rise to the fact that these are very robust findings. Um, but on the right-hand side, what you see is that individual differences, um, that different people uh, generate different weight functions for probabilities. And this is important because what that means is that um, a probability of 1 in 10 uh, mean, may mean something very different to one person than another person. And in fact, what we found that um, the degree of linearity of that weight function was directly related to uh, the degree of uh, activation in an area including the anterior cingulate. So then we also were interested in uh, a another important component which is time. Um, and this is a, f uh, so we've long known about this phenomenon, many uh, economists have studied this, that we value, that the value of an option when I make a decision depends on when actually I receive the option as, a, as an outcome. So for example, if I have to decide between uh, receiving one dollar now or uh, one dollar uh, or ten dollars in, in a year, te technically speaking, I should prefer the ten dollars in a year. But practically, what people are doing, they're discounting the future values. And the degree to which they're discounting um, is, uh, can, again, vary individuals. And there have been lots of discussions of what the precise functional formula of this discounting is. Here's are two examples um, of uh, what's called an exponential versus uh, 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 hyperbolic discounting. Um, basically, the bottom line is that uh, different people have different discounting rates, that's the degree to which they uh, devalue the future, and that can give rise to, again, very interesting phenomena that happens. For example, that you might prefer something that actually doesn't give you that much uh, feedback, that you, uh, uh, or that uh, you might prefer partying uh, tonight over studying for a final in a week from now. So we again used a very similar framework that we did for probabilistic uh, for the probabilistic assessment, looking at time. And what we found is that um, in, in in our particular experiments, we had actually two different dif discounting uh, domains. One was within the domain of a year or less. The other one was in the domain of a year or more. But the important aspect of what we found is that indiv individual differences dependent on activation in uh, two uh, particular brain areas: the insular cortex. Um, and the striatum, such that uh, individuals who have greater activations in the striatum showed more stronger discounting, essentially devalued future outcomes more. Now lastly, another important factor that affects, again, these are all different factors that you have to consider as you're making a decision, is what's called risk and uncertainty. And risk and uncertainty have very specific meanings in, uh, in the uh, economy literature, which I won't go too much into. But what people had found is that uh, using various uh, approaches, that affect, um, as it was uh, uh, labeled by the ec uh, economist, play an important role in risk and uncertain decision. Such that, for example, for the weight function that I had just showed you, uh, this probability uh, weight function, that um, affect tends to make the weight function more linear. So this was a, a famous study that was done uh, uh, by uh, uh, Yuval Rottenstrick and Christopher C. that showed that basically as you provide more affective range, um, uh, low, probability, uh, um, uh, low probabilities are overweight even more. And this was also put in a different context by Paul Slovich who's been studying uh, risk for a long time um, that, uh, that where, he, where basically um, he emphasized that what people do is they bring affect as a heuristic to making decisions in an uncertain situation. So this really uh, infused us with, the, with, with uh, uh, the motivation to look for what are potentially affective processing uh, 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 structures in the brain that could contribute to these decision-making situations. So we then actually uh, did a study where we looked at uh, risk-taking decision-making and again, what we found, and uh, unfortunately I can show you the, uh, the, the highlights here, but what we found essentially is that um, 
the, in, the insula, in particular the anterior insula, was critically important for risk-related decision-making in that particular situation. We found essentially uh, three major things. The first is that compared to safe decisions, um, the insula uh, was significantly more active during risky decision. That's the uh, bar graph that you see there. But also we found that the greater the activation in that insula region, um, the more likely you were engaged in subsequently safe behavior. So in other words, uh, if you had a strong activation of the risky uh, um, uh, decision making in that particular area, you then were punished, you then pulled back and you basically uh, engaged in safe behavior. And lastly, we uh, showed a direct relationship between the, uh, the degree of neuroticism and the degree of harm avoidance and the amount of insular activation, such that those individuals who had the greatest level of neuroticism and who had the greatest level of harm avoidance also had the greatest uh, activation in that insular region during risky decision making. So this got us really excited about understanding what might the insula be in uh, a role be in uh, in, uh, in decision making, and this came at a time when two uh, 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 two individuals were working on this from a, a somewhat uh, slightly different perspective. So we were very inspired by uh, Bud Craig's work, who outlined the anatomical pathways that the insula takes and highlighted the importance of the role of the peripheral body as a representation in the brain, and also the work of uh, Tony Damasio and Anton Bishara, who actually were the first to formulate decision making in terms of having what's called a body loop, which is essentially providing body uh, relevant afferences um, to uh, weigh which option you were going to take when you make a decision, and what they would call an as-if loop, which is after you uh, uh, have repeatedly gotten body afferences, you can actually represent these body afferences in the brain. So you have essentially a, brain, uh, a body represent, uh, representation in the brain. So this really got us very excited about uh, uh, trying to study what is it that is uh, dysfunctional and might be dysfunctional in the insula in, uh, in uh, psychiatric disorders. And we also had uh, various uh, experiments that we did, and here's one example where we showed that different parts of the insula are actually processing um, various uh, uh, incoming information at different point in time. Um, what I'm showing here is essentially just showing that the anterior insula uh, is particularly uh, uh, acting anticipation of a stimulus. In this particular case, it was a, a human touch. Um, the whole insula, in particular the mid and posterior insula, is actually mostly active during the touch itself. And then the anterior insula, again, is uh, more active um, after the touch actually has occurred. So, uh, and uh, together with, um, uh, with Murray Steen, we did a, a variety of different experiments that really showed that the insula uh, uh, and, uh, popped out in, 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 in various experiments that was uh, related to uh, ang anxiety constructs or uh, directly to anxiety. Um, here I'm showing you basically that in another decision-making situation, again, we found that bilateral anterior insula was related in a decision-making situation to neuroticism. Um, in another task, we showed that in an am effective ambu ambiguity situation, when you were making a decision, uh, the degree of intolerance of uncertainty, which is a very important construct in anxiety, was also related to bilateral uh, insular information, uh, in insular activity. And then here, in a uh, what we called anxiety-prone population, we showed that during the anticipation of an aversive event, the anxiety-prone individuals have much greater insula uh, activity activation than uh, the uh, uh, anxiety non-prone individuals. So uh, all of this together gives us the idea that um, the insula is a key component in processing anxiety-related states. So we formulated this a number of years ago now, um, and what, what we proposed and what we hypothesized was um, that what's happening in the insula is that individuals, when they're seeing a stimulus, they're uh, essentially retrieving a body to aid their decision making. So for example, uh, in, on the left hand side you see a, a house and you see an angry face. So say for example this house is, or this building is related to you meeting a person who might be angry at you. The fact is that the house becomes a stimulus that uh, creates an anticipatory state which then creates an internal body state through the acid that was described by Damasio and others. And we propose that essentially what's happening is that the brain creates an error signal between that predicted body state and a comparative body state, and that then, through the various connections within the insula, uh, influences motivated behavior. <laughs>
Um, on uh, uh, revised this a little bit in terms of actually putting this in the context of uh, uh, what Damasio and, uh, had, and others have put in uh, the central pathway and the peripheral pathway and uh, uh, proposed that essentially what the insula is doing is it's amplifying or uh, uh, what happens in anxious people. They're amplifying uh, salient events um, and what the resultant of this is is that you have a lack of signal to noise separation. This actually will become important in, uh, at the very end where I'm showing you that with computational tools we can now precisely address that question. So at the same time, uh, we were also doing a series of addiction, and we found that uh, uh, through now on a pragmatic side, that the insula really also played an important uh, uh, role in, uh, in addictive processes. So this was a study that was done uh, early on. This is uh, 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 over, uh, 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 over a decade old now. And I have to highlight, and I have to actually uh, um, say that this was probably one of our studies where we vastly overpredicted the precision of our uh, prediction. Um, but what we found is that essentially, among other areas, um, that when we took individuals who were hospitalized in a drug treatment program and we uh, scanned them during the first three weeks of their uh, hospitalization, and we did a simple decision-making task, which I don't want to go into at this point, but then we asked the question, could that activation actually predict who was going to go on to relapse um, and who was going to on, go on to uh, say abstinent. What we're able to show is that those individuals who engaged in the decision-making task, the insula more, is likely to uh, relapse and uh, uh, with some decent uh, sensitivity and specificity. And then we replicated this in another um, cohort, again showing that uh, in now in a risk-taking decision-making uh, task, that those individuals who had um, a less different activation in to, during risk and safe choices um, were also the ones that uh, were more likely to relapse. And then uh, uh, in addition, uh, we also showed that uh, those who were not calibrating uh, I I the insula according to risk were also overall engaging in more risky uh, behaviors. Um, and found the same thing in another uh, cohort of uh, uh, stimulant-dependent individuals, where in another decision-making task, those individuals who relapsed failed to show uh, significant uh, activation during outcomes in a, uh, in a reward-related decision-making task. And finally, when we looked at directly stimulating the body with an aversive interoceptive uh, 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 paradigm, what we were able to show now in a group of people who were at risk for developing problem behaviors uh, related to stimulants, that those individuals who failed to activate uh, the insula were at greatest risk for developing problem-related behaviors um, uh, down the road. Um, so that essentially gave us a, a sort of a framework, a heuristic framework for thinking about the insular role in addiction. And what we proposed is that, again, uh, combining the central pathway and the peripheral pathway, that what due to various exposures, um, essentially the central pathway um, generates a, a prediction about certain environments that anticipated uh, that anticipate the, uh, uh, the the delivery of the drug, and of course the peripheral pathway also signals information because the drugs by themselves, in particular stimulants, have profound uh, effects on the body. And again, what we proposed here that what actually is happening that for people who are either at risk uh, for stimulant use or who are more likely uh, to relapse after stimulant uh, dependence um, are those who, are, who inappropriately um, compute the difference between that predicted body state and uh, the current body state. So almost like the opposite of what we're seeing in anxiety. So at this stage, uh, what I've shown you is essentially uh, heuristic models of how to think about or how we might think about uh, the, uh, uh, the dysfunction that we're seeing in addiction and the uh, dysfunction that we're seeing in anxiety. But the problem with this, of course, you can build models and you can build heuristics um, uh, and you can begin to uh, potentially parse these heuristics. But the problem is we have a, a limited way of quantitatively testing this. And this is where I think patient psychiatry can be extremely uh, helpful. So I just want to contrast what 
one, one arm or one component of computational psychiatry, which um, comparing sort of the old approach, which we've done and many, many other people have done, where we look at a behavior, say, um, and we basically uh, 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 look at another level of, this, say, brain imaging or genetics or whatever. And then we use a correlational uh, approach to relate one behavior uh, to another. That's essentially um, what a lot of us have been doing for, for many, many years. I think what um, computational psychiatry adds to that is that instead of uh, using a sort of black box or correlational or whatever you want to call a model, we now actually make explicit what is our processing model? What is it, how do we think about um, the behavior and, and, and the brain association? And what's important here, and I think this is something that actually uh, Yael pointed out earlier, as we're doing this, we're formulating the C's. And we are more often wrong than right. Uh, it was, it was really actually nice to see when she showed, you know, uh, how, how we learn in situations. And she said, it wasn't this, it wasn't that, it wasn't this. So basically what she was doing, she was putting different processing models in the middle and she was refuting hypotheses as she was doing this. And this is really a full approach. I think we should think of computational psychiatry as providing us these tools to do these complex processing hypotheses. So what I'm, what I'm going to show you now is a few examples. But before I do this, I want to talk a little bit about what I would call failure modes. And this gets back to how do we frame what might be going on in uh, uh, patients or in subjects with psychiatric uh, conditions. So we recently kind of um, uh, formulated this in, an, in, a, in, a, in a review paper. But I'm going to walk you through this a little bit because I think it helps you to understand how to think of computational models in a non-mathematical way. Um, so there are two kinds of modes that we proposed. One we call hyper-precise priors, and I will tell you exactly what I mean by that. Um, and the other is uh, what we call context rigidity. And in fact, um, uh, as I was uh, listening to some of the talks this morning, there's actually already quite a bit of evidence from other groups that uh, uh, these are, uh, uh, these are implementing various uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, I just want to highlight um, uh, uh, Al Powers' work that has done some beautiful work in, in hallucinations, uh, emphasizing that maybe hyperprecise auditory uh, priors could contribute to us actually, or could contribute to people actually perceiving uh, uh, voices. Um, and uh, we've just a little bit of about context rigidity in, uh, in Yale's talk. Um, but let me walk you through the sort of the notion of what might be a hyper-precise prior. So in a healthy brain, the prior is essentially what are the uh, beliefs that you come to a situation with. So say, for example, you're out in nature, you hear a noise, and you think you have to decide between is this a rabbit or is it going to be a bear. Um, and you have some initially some uh, prior beliefs that it could be equally likely a, 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 a rabbit or a bear. And then uh, essentially, and of course, with that, along uh, goes a lot of uh, interceptive input, depending on whether you think it's going to be a, prior, a, a bear or a, a rabbit. But then you actually get the evidence. You see whether a, a rabbit comes out of the bush or whether it's a bear. And of course, what happens is that as a consequence of that, you update uh, uh, your, your, your priors. And now, the next time you're in that situation, um, you, you're much more likely to think that, yes, if I hear something rustling in the bushes, it's probably going to be a, a, a rabbit, it's not going to be a bear. So we're basically adjusting our, um, uh, our belief systems to our, uh, based on our prior experiences. And of course, this is all done uh, uh, in a computational way based in a Bayesian framework. Um, but what we propose is that in a dysfunctional brain, what's happening is that you have a person that has a very strong belief systems um, that already exist prior to actually getting any evidence. Um, in this case, maybe uh, the person has a very strong prior that there, uh, uh, that there will be a bear. And essentially, what happens at that point is the, in, the incoming evidence is discounted and the model is subsequently not uh, adjusted. So that even though you may have seen a rabbit, the next time around, you'll believe it's a bear and it's not going to be a rabbit. And so that would be one failure mode where you basically don't adjust your priors based on the evidence. The other uh, failure mode um, that, uh, is, is what we would call context, uh, call context rigidity. And this is exactly what actually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we heard about earlier this morning uh, in that Say you have a, you have, again, you have a prior belief in a certain situation that it might be a bear or a rabbit, but now you're in a different uh, situation. Maybe you are, uh, you were in, in, in the forest, in the woods, and now you're in a, uh, in a prairie, and you have to readjust your uh, prior beliefs because now you're in a different context. And um, 
in a healthy brain, the idea is that the healthy brain can adjust and use the different context to essentially modify uh, uh, the, uh, the prior belief and then take in the evidence appropriately. Um, but then again, in the uh, dysfunctional brain, and again, we put this in the context of anxiety, that the, the, the prior evidence in uh, the, the overwhelming hyper-precise prior of a bear is transferred into another context so that even though now you are in the prairie, you still think there could be a bear out there. So these two failure modes is what we're now looking into. And the beauty of this is that you know, while we're uh, formulating this here uh, um, very much in a, in a verbal colloquial, we can make this very precise with uh, computational models. Um, and so um, we've been thinking a lot about what could be a computational failure mode in, in, in anxiety. And this is actually work that was inspired by uh, uh, what uh, Michael Browning and uh, Sonia Bishop did a number of years ago, and uh, Michael has been doing over the last few years, um, which basically this paper uh, showed that anxious people really don't adjust well to different environments. So in this particular case, they had a, 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 they had a learning environment. In one case, it was uh, very uh, stable. In another case, it was very unstable. Um, and in, partic in this particular case, they learned from, uh, from negative. Um, and, and the point here is that normally, when you have a very volatile environment, uh, because you don't really know what the true state of affair is, you should be careful in learning. Uh, but if it's a very stable environment, you actually uh, uh, should be fairly uh, uh, confident and you should update uh, properly. And what they showed is that those individuals who had greater trade anxiety scores really do this uh, as differentially as those people who had uh, a lower trade anxiety scores. And so um, we did a study um, in looking, in this case, at, a, at what's called a um, change point detection task. And without going into the detail, what we found is that in anxious people, what is happening is that they have high base learning rate. So they learn from, uh, 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 from uh, random events as much as they learn from non-random events. And they don't adjust their learning rate uh, around a change point. So in other words, when a change point comes along where you really need to learn, because now something different has happened, they don't uh, 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 generate appropriately. And we were able to show this, uh, that this type of dysfunction is related to uh, a certain a strategic behavior like win, stay, lose, shift, and so on and so forth. So this was essentially one um, uh, example where we could show, using a computational model, that there actually, in fact, may be a problem uh, differentiating signal in anxious people um, um, and so we are now looking into this in, 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 more, uh, in more detail. Now on the, on the addiction side, we've been interested in, again, updating and, and, and we've been working uh, together with Angela Yu from uh, UCSD, um, who's a, a, a cognitive uh, and computational neuroscientist, who had uh, what's called the dynamic uh, Bayesian uh, model approach, or DBM approach. And um, so the idea here is that what we're doing, just like what I showed you with the rabbit and the bear, is we're forming expectations about what we're about to observe. So uh, this was in the context of a, uh, of a stop signal task. So the idea is that as a stop signal task, I carry with me a, uh, an internal representation on how likely it is that the stop signal will actually occur. And then I can be surprised if a stop signal actually does occur versus if a stop signal does not occur. And so um, uh, basically we created this uh, we, we model to uh, estimate what's the internal estimation of the probability of stopping and is this estimation actually represented in the brain and does this tell us anything clinically useful? So those were the basic the questions. Um, and so what we found is that, um, for example, in uh, individuals uh, were at risk for stimulant dependence, this was a, uh, this, this risk group that I talked about earlier, that they did not have a very strong representation of this P-stop, uh, of this probability of stopping in uh, the areas that are normally very important for a stopping behavior, like the inferior frontal gyrus, um, uh, versus those who, uh, 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 versus their comparison group. And then we later showed that, um, in fact, as we followed those people over time, those individuals who had the poorest representation of the P-stop in the brain and who also did not update their brain based on the Bayesian uh, prediction error um, were most likely to get into trouble with, uh, uh, with problem use in the future. And then lastly, she, uh, uh, and this is uh, work really that was done by uh, Katja Harla, um, we showed that, again, in areas that are important for stop behavior, those individuals who didn't have a good stop model were also the one 
uh, uh, were more likely to uh, uh, relapse. Uh, so again, looking at the relapse uh, uh, in, in, in stimulant uh, 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 addiction. So taking, taking this all together, what we were able to show in the, in the, in the drug users, um, that problem users, but not the sister, failed to build a good internal model of the environment. And that vitamin dependents uh, uh, that were more likely to relapse have a less well-developed internal uh, model of the environment and are less efficient in updating the model when presented with new information. So that is what I would call uh, some evidence, some initial evidence of context uh, rigidity, in, in the sense that the individual is unable to adjust their pression um, to a different context. So basically what I showed you up to now is, that is, is our transition from trying to understand from a descriptive perspective how decision making is influenced by probability, by time, by value, uh, and by risk to uh, forming models of how this might be in stand brain and what the insula might be contributing to that, to then making these models more precise by putting computational models uh, to these heuristic models. But now I'm going to show you some caveats, and this is work done by others. But I want to, uh, I, I'm showing you this because I want to also get you excited about where we're going to go in the future. So this is, I think, one of the papers that will uh, be very important for us uh, in the future. This was actually the, the, uh, the bioarchive preprint that the Poldrack group uh, published. Um, it was subsequently published uh, uh, by Nkavi and others in PNAS. Uh, what this shows is essentially what they did, they, a large number of individuals using Amazon MTurk. Um, and they did, they were interested in a construct called self-regulation. It's a very broad construct. But what they essentially did, a number of different uh, behavioral tests and a number of different surveys in the broader sense related to these constructs. And what they then looked at, and this is sort of on the, in, in that figure B, um, they looked at the correlation uh, between uh, tasks and be the correlation between surveys. And what they found is that there's a relatively decent correlation between various surveys. So, for example, uh, uh, the uh, Barrett Impulsivity Scale uh, uh, measures something very similar than the UPPS. Um, and they showed that uh, there is a less um, a strong correlation between various tasks. So the go, no go task measures something that is like inhibition, but somewhat less similar uh, uh, than say the stop signal task. But the thing that was really actually concerning, if they then looked at the relationship between task and surveys, found that essentially on average the correlation was zero, which is pretty, uh, 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 which is pretty uh, um, uh, 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 jarring. Because what that says is that what be, when we ask our the subjects, how do you feel, what do you do, and we make them do different tasks, what we, our expectation should be, because this is sort of our, that there is actually not a lot of relationship. And this has been found actually, and I can say this uh, because we've done a lot of other work, uh, this is probably uh, one of the biggest uh, conundrums, that we have very weak relationships between what people are telling us and what we're measuring with these tasks. The other thing that they showed is that if, you, if they had some subgroup of these and retested, and what they showed, which is now also something that not just only this group has shown, is that for the survey measures, we get very nice in, what's called intra-class correlation. So if I ask you, are you depressed today, and I've asked you, to, uh, are you depressed tomorrow, most likely you're going to give me the same uh, um, uh, answer. The problem is much more mixed with the, the average um, intra-class correlation coefficient is around 0.5, but there's a lot of spread. And what that means is that if I make you do my decision-making task today, I can't be at all sure that you're going to be responding the same way if I give you that task tomorrow. That's a problem because that limits the precision we can uh, behaviorally assess what we're doing, and it limits the precision with which we can say that uh, Joe might be doing the decision-making task differently than Jane. So this is something that we really have to uh, try to work out. Um, Another, uh, 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 another area that I think is very, very important, and it's, it, it popped up uh, a meeting, uh, various uh, symposia uh, during this meeting, but I think people have not fully yet grasped what that actually means. This is a, uh, a paper that came out recently in JAMA Psychiatry by Thomas Wolfer's uh, Andre Marquand's group. And what they basically showed, and I'm not going to go into details, but what they showed, and not just in this paper, they have a subsequent paper now uh, looking at ADHD as well, that our concept of an average patient is completely wrong. And if, if, if you really believe this, and, and you know, these are evidence that, it sh uh, that you should believe it, what that means is that we should completely throw out case control designs. That's a very strong statement. Um, so 
uh, the point being, and, and what they basically show, highlight, is that patients are much more different amongst each other than, uh, 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 than controls are amongst uh, one another, and they're much more different from controls uh, 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 than, uh, 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 than the controls are from each other. So the point is, there is no uniform schizophrenia patient, or there is no uniform bipolar patient, or there is no uniform ADHD uh, patient. Really, really challenging problem. So we have to think about how, how we're going to address this in the future. And finally, is it, um, oops. So basically, uh, we're now at the stage where we, have, where we have emerging tools. You might ask, why is it that computational psychiatry has surfaced uh, uh, so dramatically in years? I think there are probably a couple of reasons I want to highlight. The first is we have uh, created a generative community. Um, I cannot overstate uh, the work that many people that are now in the computational psychiatry community have done to create uh, public tools that are publicly available. Uh, Janina had, has just showed that you know she has made uh, all of her tools available. This is important because we need to have these tools uh, out there. Um, and uh, also that uh, you know we have a, a plethora of uh, behavioral models and, and, and computational models that are now available. We can compare these models. We have tools to actually do the model comparisons. So this is a, 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 another. A, a, and then the, the notion that what our goal is to connect our first level experience as, pay, as individuals, you know, whether we're depressed, whether we uh, experience um, hallucinations or delusions, with actually what might be going on in the brain. But there are, lastly, I want to point out what I think will be necessary to uh, really move the field forward. And I've been working on with uh, uh, Quentin uh, Hoyce, and we published this together with Tiago Maya, but uh, we've also basically uh, implemented this here in bi at Biological Psychiatry with Michael Browning. The notion is that we really need a concerted effort to move uh, this forward. As you could probably imagine, there's a lot of uh, technical details in these models. Um, that uh, really uh, the, the, the academically interested psychiatrist has limited uh, time and resources to gather. So we really need to work together. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to engage the, um, the preclinical group, um, which is what I would call the computational neuroscientist, uh, the, the, the machine learning people, who basically build and identify uh, uh, models and measures um, that actually help us, uh, 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 to, that are robust, that have uh, good reliability, that measure a particular construct, that uh, arbitrate between models. We then need to see how actually these models uh, can then be instantiated, that's sort of the, what I would call phase one, into uh, uh, different uh, patient groups. But then we quickly need to scale up uh, the, the problem because, again, if we believe that these, uh, uh, these patient groups are highly heterogeneous, we're not going to get away with just starting 20, 40, 50, 100 people. We're going to have to study hundreds and hundreds of people to really uh, reliable and robust results. Um, and then obviously we need to see, can this actually be helpful? So can we use these tests, uh, can we use these uh, computational models at tests for say relapse prediction, for risk for disease, for risk for recurrence, for response to medication, for response to behavioral therapies? Those are clinical questions I think that are critical. So I want to uh, uh, really thank, again, uh, uh, the, the organizer. But before doing this, what I think where computational psychiatry can be really helpful, I think it can be helpful in organizing and helping us organizing our thinking in a quantitative way and bring together the explanatory uh, uh, and the side together so that we can build uh, uh, mechanistically informed uh, disease models that have pragmatic value in making predictions for our patients. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you, and I want to thank all the people on this picture. This can only be done uh, uh, with a village, so thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. That was a wonderful talk, and a, I think a beautiful overview of the state of the art of the field of computational psychiatry. Um, there's time for um, a couple of questions, or one question before lunch. I think, yes, over there. Yes, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I had a question whether any of these Bayesian models or computational models in general to craving, Q-induced craving, mm -hmm. it would seem like a natural area where the updating has gone awry. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a, it's a, a fantastic question. Yeah, we're, we're just, uh, that's exactly, we have a craving paradigm that we're now uh, 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 using. Um, basically, that, we haven't done it yet, but that's what we will be doing. Great, thanks. Well, I, I think given the time, unless there's another, well, okay, one more question. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two linked questions. The first question is, would you allow to say that um, the 
uh, lacking fear of variation of body pattern, pattern, of the internal body pattern, leads to a higher risk of substance if used because the substance yeah. disintegrates the body pattern. It's yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, because we found it both in the uh, at-risk individuals as well as in the relapse individuals, I uh, think that this is a potentially a fairly basic risk uh, 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 characteristic. So yeah. not appreciating um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the body state that goes with a risky situation is probably a risk factor for you engaging in drug use to begin with and problematic drug use. Yes, and uh, the second question is, as a consequence to sexual abuse, we can await a disrupting body pattern. So would you see there a link between abuse, being abused and later abusing substances? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a really important. Uh, we haven't actually specifically looked at um, the relationship between body prediction error and uh, childhood trauma, but I, I, that, that would be my, actually my, my intuition, that uh, part of the early life trauma uh, sensitizes the structure to be more reactive and possibly uh, result in these uh, phenotypes. Yeah. Okay, thanks.